This program is recorded and presented by Chippewa Valley Community Television. This is a rebroadcast of the Eau Claire School Board meeting. The audio for this program can be heard on WRFPLP 101.9 FM. Let's call to order tonight's Board of Education meeting. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Secretary Iverson, have we complied with the Opens Me's Law notification this evening? Yes, we have. Thank you. Uh, please uh, call roll. Commissioner Duax. Present. Commissioner Hambuck Boyle? Absent. Commissioner Johnson? Here. Commissioner Luganbill? Here. Commissioner Spindler? Here. Commissioner Vu? Here. Commissioner Zhang? Here. Great, thank you. Uh, so tonight uh, we have uh, one person signed up for our public forum, and that is Melissa Greer. You want to come up, Melissa? Just state your name and address. Thanks. Hi, my name is Melissa Greer, 2827 Stein Boulevard, Eau Claire, Wisconsin, 54701. Um, tonight as a fourth grade teacher from Putnam Heights Elementary School um, coming to encourage your support of the more flexible leave system um, that is before you tonight for voting on for the Eau Claire School District staff. Um, I'm sure you're aware that right now um, we receive 10 sick days and one personal day and that the more flexible system would allow us to have eight sick days and three personal days. Um, and the reason why this is important to me, um, I think in order to understand that, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about my story. Um, I grew up in a suburb of St. Paul um, and came to the University of Eau Claire um, to earn my bachelor's degree in teaching. And I received an excellent education. I student taught right here in the Eau Claire district. And then in 2003, when I was searching for my first teaching job, decided to look for one back home and shortly thereafter found a job in the Twin Cities. Um, I spent seven years as a classroom teacher there, and in the summer of 2010, um, had both a reason and an opportunity to relocate here to Eau Claire. And I didn't think anything of it. I knew this community, I knew this school system, I knew this state. I had no idea that six months later, I would be in the auditorium at Memorial learning about Act 10 and what it would mean for me in education. Now, six years later, I'm 13 years into my career and still frozen on step three of your pay scale, of our pay scale. And I know that you all are very aware of that and I thank you for your commitment to investigating um, and working on um, the salary schedule and I feel as though this board is very committed um, to making changes and I also realize that your hands are somewhat tied. Um, I can tell you that to me, even though the switch from 10-1 to 8-3 isn't more, it is more. As somebody who has family and friends out of town, it gives me the flexibility to be able to spend more time with them. And that's not something that has a price tag. And so I just want to thank you for considering it and to know that it feels like it feels like something. It feels like, you know, you're acknowledging the fact that, you know, yes, maybe we can't give you more right now, but this is something we could do um, to honor your commitment to our district. So that's why I encourage you to vote for it. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Melissa. All right. Uh, so next, superintendent's report. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to review the upcoming events for the Board of Education. On February 18th at 4 p.m., uh, there will be a meeting of the Demographic Trends and Facilities Committee. Um, and that will be at 4 o'clock here at the Administration Building. On February 19th, there will be a Budget Development Committee meeting, and that will be held from 10.30 until 12.30 p.m. here at the Administration Building. On February 22nd, um, there is a legislative breakfast that is hosted by Chippewa Falls, and this is a um, this is a kind of an annual get together of the three boards: Chippewa Falls, Altoona, and Eau Claire. Um, and they have some time with the legislators to talk about um, the state of our budget and that kind of thing. An opportunity to question 
um, legislators about pending legislation. That will be at 7.30 a.m. Uh, at the Avalon Hotel and Conference Center uh, in Chippewa. Um, on March 7th, uh, at 10.30 a.m., there's a meeting of the Policy and Governance Committee here at the Administration Building. There's also a school board meeting. Um, on March 8th, there's a Charter Choice Committee meeting at 4 p.m. in the Administration Building. On March 10th, there's another Demographic Trends and Facilities meeting at 4 p.m. at the Administration Building. And on March 14th, there is a Parent Advisory Council meeting scheduled. Um, and uh, we'll be talking about that more later. So tonight we have two schools to recognize. Um, both Locust Lane and Longfellow are being recognized as Wisconsin Title I Schools of Recognition for the 2015-16 school year. This distinction is awarded to schools with high levels of poverty and remarkable successes in educating their students. This is Longfellow's 11th time receiving the award and Locust Lane's fifth consecutive year receiving the award. And they will receive their awards at a state capitol ceremony next month. Both schools receive the Beating uh, the Odd Schools Award. This means that they are in the top 25% of high poverty schools in the state and have above average student achievement in reading and mathematics when compared to schools from similarly, similarly sized districts, schools, grade configurations, and economic levels. So this is a great achievement for both schools and we're very grateful to the staff at both schools and to the principals for their leadership of those schools. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, next is the uh, president's report. Um, I was going to mention the legislative breakfast also. It is at Avalon Hotel. If uh, uh, board members, you can make it, that would be great. Um, I do want to remind board members um, about the, uh, there's a human resources and legal and human resources conference. Um, done by WASB, February 25th through 26th. So anyone who wants to go there, there's some really good com uh, good um, topics in there. And just uh, check with Patty about making that. I, can I say something? Yes, go ahead, Catherine. I just wanted, I'm interested in going. If anybody else wants to go, let me know. OK, great, good. And carpool down there. All right, student representative for Jason, go ahead. Um, I want to first congratulate um, Bailey Zhang for being a regional finalist of the Kalukula Scholars um, Scholarship Program. And the initial application was 87,000 applicants. And uh, Billy was one of the 250 applicants to be a regional finalist. I think that's quite a big deal. Um, so congratulations to Billy. And another thing is the Oakland Memorial North Swim and Dive Team. They won their conference championship on Saturday. So that's another pretty big deal. <laughs> um, and the Students Against Destructive Disorder, Destructive Decisions, um, they were on the news and they were um, telling, um, they were um, promoting um, how drinking can negatively impact the students' behavior, students' uh, lifestyle choices. And I think it's very good for them. Um, and uh, I also want to congratulate the FBLA for uh, receiving lots of honors uh, at their regional leadership competition. Uh, there are actually quite a few names. <laughs> uh, Kaya Patera, uh, Maggie Lewick, uh, Faith Clark, uh, Jeannie uh, Rodriguez, Jesse Becker, Caroline uh, Way, Michaela Stoll, Maggie Faith, um, and all these uh, students, they received honors in the competition. And my final report is um, uh, on the table, on your table, there is a February 2016 school student start time survey results Memorial High School. And before I dive into this, I want to thank uh, the Memorial Administration, uh, Mrs. McCorney, um, the English Department, the Student Council, and all the others who helped um, design and implement this survey. Um, and I will go up on the uh, projector so that I can talk about this.
Okay, so here's the school start time survey results for Memorial High School. So we had 921 students participate in the survey. And the survey was posted to the MHS website and the students uh, took the surveys took the survey during English class. Um, that this is from this is ninth graders and twelfth graders. Um, and only memorial students were allowed to take the survey. And our first question was which school day would you prefer? And the results are quite divided actually. 50.4% um, of the students at Memorial said that they would like uh, a change in start time from 8.35 to 3.47 p.m. But 49.60% of the students want the time that we have now, which is 7.35 a.m. to 2.58 p.m. And then our second question is, what impact would late later start end times have on your involvement in extracurricular activities. And 72% of students believe that later start times would either have no impact or make, more, make them more likely to participate in extracurriculars. And 27.40% of the students right here said that they would be less likely to participate in extracurriculars if the switch, if, if school time were to start later in the day. Our third question is, what impact would later start end times have on your job? And 65% of students believe that later start times would have no impact or make them more likely to get a job. Uh, just over one third of students reported that later start times would have a negative impact on their likelihood to get a job. So 34.50% of students said, said uh, later start times would mean less likely to participate or less likely to get a job. And on the back of this sheet, we have two questions. Um, the first question is, what advantages would there be to a later start time? And this comment below is the, it is the most popular comment that the students have given. Um, this is a student of um, 921 students who took the survey. And the most popular comment is, the main advantages of a later start time would be increased sleep, many mentions of connection between sleep and their focus, ability to learn, and more likelihood to participate more in class in the morning. Also, many students reference a likely increase in attendance and decrease in tardies. The second question that we had is, what concerns do you have about a later start time? Okay, so for question number four, um, the comments, there were about 76 students who gave this kind of reply. For question number five, what concerns do you have about a later start time? There were, I believe, around 200 students who gave, who gave comments that were related to this. And this comment is, the main concerns about a later start time would be the impact it may have on sports, their ability to have a job, and potentially having less time to do their schoolwork or relax once they are done with their extracurriculars. Um, so this concludes my presentation of the school start time survey results for Memorial. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Is that, is that your last part of the report too? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right, committee reports. Um, P&G, is uh, Commissioner Duax going to be yes. you? Okay, policy and governance. Policy and governance committee met this morning at 10.30. Uh, we talked with Sue Brown, who is the food and nutrition person in our district, and we discussed wellness policy 480 and changes that are required by the USDA. Uh, we'll be getting another report from her probably in a couple of weeks about changes to the policy 480. We looked at the policy on board vacancies, and we will, you will probably see that at the next board meeting for a first reading, possible first reading. We reviewed policy 225 and made changes recommended by the board at the last meeting, and that is presented tonight. Policy 185, we discussed the board committee structure and we made changes as recommended by the board at a previous meeting. Um, 
we'll bring that forward probably at the next board meeting. Um, we looked at policy 382 um, and realized that we need to review that and that has to do with pets being brought to, to various uh, district buildings. And the next policy we will be looking at in a couple of weeks is policy 222 administrative contracts. That concludes the report. Great, thank you. Uh, so you can turn off your mic. Thanks. Okay, uh, Commissioner Zhang's going to do a uh, pack. Yes. Okay. We met last Monday. We went over roles and responsibilities as it pertains to how the PAC members are supposed to communicate or should communicate with their individual schools. We went over the uh, proposed calendar uh, and we touched on start time. Okay, thank you. Um, and the uh, other committee that I know met was Charter, and I'm the only one here now that was at that Charter committee meeting. And we basically discussed um, the process for um, that uh, staff could uh, propose innovation zones um, and um, discussed how that process might work, as well as how we might let staff know about it. So, Okay, legislative update. Is that it for committees? I think that covers it. Yes. Uh, so legislative update, uh, Commissioner Hambach boyle is not here this evening, but uh, Commissioner Luganville, you have one thing to pass on about it. Go ahead. Yeah, Chris is flying home tonight, but she texted me just an update on this. Um, so a bill is set to go before the State Assembly tomorrow, and it will be imposing additional restrictions on our school district, um, and that's AB 751, which pertains to the, state, the uh, Special Needs Scholarship Program. Um, the bill makes mostly technical changes, and WASB was actually neutral on it, and they just provided information up until now, um, but they actually are now strongly opposing it because of an additional amendment. Um, so according to this, uh, according to the Legislative Fiscal Bureau, the amendment would cost school districts, 142 school districts specifically, $14.2 million. That's a reduction they would receive. Um, the current funding formula enables school districts uh, to cover the lost revenue used to pay for school vouchers as well as any additional costs for busing of eligible voucher students, administering services for EL, special education students participating in the voucher program. But this legislation would not cover the lost revenue to public schools. Um, so this amendment would essentially fund private school voucher students at the expense of public school students, which is something that we were promised wouldn't happen. Um, so, uh, I would ask that everyone contact your legislators and call them up. And I have the phone numbers of the three who uh, locally they say are planning on voting for it. So I'm just going to read the phone numbers if you want to write them down or put them in your phone. Uh, so Warren Petrick, 608-266-0660. Terry Moulton, 608-266-7511. Two six six nine one seven two, and like I said, um, the assembly is taking this up tomorrow, and the Senate version is going to be pretty shortly. So make those phone calls. And I would just make a point that the, the board has not taken a position on any of these, so we can say you can make phone calls on whatever your position is uh, to your legislators. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, everybody. Um, consent uh, resolution agenda. Um, now, uh, so this is the items that the board votes on all at once, unless a uh, a uh, board member wishes to poll and vote on it separately. These have been considered before are routine matters. So, uh, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes of February first, twenty sixteen. I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the closed session, February first, twenty sixteen. I would entertain a motion to approve the financial report of January, twenty sixteen. I would entertain a motion to approve the gifts in the amount of twenty one thousand six hundred fifty. $58.68 for the period of January 1 through January 31, 2016. Pull it. Pull it. Okay. I would entertain a motion to approve the Human Resources Employment Report. I would entertain a motion to approve the revision to sick leave uh, slash flexible leave. I would entertain a motion to approve the revisions to policy 221, recruitment slash employment of superintendent. I would entertain a motion to approve uh, the adoption of new policy 665, fraud prevention and reporting. Okay, so we, ha we need a motion to approve all of those except the one that was polled, which was the gifts. I move. We have a motion from Commissioner Zhang. We have a second from Commissioner Duax. Okay, 
Any discussion? Well, I know we probably should pull them if we want to discuss. I just want to make two, two comments. One, um, when watching the news this morning, they implied, well, I think they more than implied, they um, said that our fraud prevention and reporting policy was in reaction to the events in the county. Um, and I just want to point out that that was coincidence and that our fraud policy, um, well, the acts, the current events in the county certainly have pointed out the need for this, that that was caught in a policy review before the news story in the county broke. So it's a coincidence, not in reaction to the, the events in the county. And then um, I just want to point out, in case anybody actually reads the minutes, um, the, it, the February 1st minutes, I um, had Patty make a correction to my request for future agenda items. And it's very different than what it was, I think. And so if you're looking at that for agenda setting, to use the current version, not what was out this morning. Thank you. OK, uh, so we have a motion and a second for all those except the gifts. Um, and so uh, let's see. Let me just check. Yeah, we can, do a, we can do a voice vote on this. So all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion passes. So, Commissioner Johnson, uh, you pulled the gifts and the amount. Go ahead. Well, I'm going to abstain again until we get a um, an equity review of our gifting. Um, again, there's a rather large donation, which, of course, we're very grateful for, but it um, goes to the orchestra program at one high school and not the other. And so, um, you know, if, if there's advantages or equipment that one school is getting and the other isn't, I'm concerned that um, we're creating inequities by accepting large gifts that only go to, to, to one school at a, at a level. Okay, thank you. So I could use a motion to approve that if we have a motion. The gifts. I so much. I have a motion, second. Commissioner Duax. We have a second, Commissioner Luganville. Any other discussion on that? Okay, I think we need a roll call vote on that, please. Commissioner Vu? Yes. Commissioner Zhang? Yes. Commissioner Duex? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Abstain. Commissioner Luganbill? Yes. Commissioner Spindler? Yes. Great, thank you, everybody. All right, individual considered resolutions. Uh, so the first is a very standard one. We, I could use a resolution. Uh, I'd entertain a motion to approve the payment of all bills in the amount of $9,043,965.71 and net payroll in the amount of $3,068,664.52 for the period of January 1 through the 31st of 2016. So moved, but I think you meant 73 cents. Uh, what did I say? 71. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm tired. 73 cents, thank you. Second. Okay, so motion for Commissioner Johnson, a second from Commissioner Zhang. Any discussion on this? Okay, we should do a roll call vote on that, please. Commissioner Vu? Yes. Commissioner Zhang? Yes. Commissioner Duax? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Luganbill? Yes. Commissioner Spindler? Yes. All right, motion passes. Um, so the next uh, piece is uh, kind of a unique uh, situation. We have a petitioner, um, is it it's Mondovi, correct? Uh, in Mondovi, um, was petitioning to request to alter school district boundaries. Um, basically to move their uh, property to the Eau Claire School District property. Um, if you look in, um, in the agenda item for that, uh, board members, uh, there is um, a list of um, uh, uh, factors that must be considered in um, whether or not to approve uh, such a request. Um, we also have to uh, grant a meeting with uh, the petitioners if they so wish. Um, so the first thing I would like to do on this is to um, a motion to suspend our rules for public comment to allow the petitioners to speak to us if they wish. And we can speak I to so them. move. So I have a motion of Commissioner Duax. Can I have a second on second. that? Second. I have a second from Commissioner Lugano to s suspend the rules just for this piece so that they could uh, speak to us about this and then we can move forward on it. So uh, all those in favor of suspending those rules, say aye. I'm opposed? Okay, motion passes. Um, so uh, if the petitioners, are you, are you here? Would you like to speak if you're here to the board? Or the board, I don't know if they were here. Is that, I don't know who it is. 
Oh, okay. All right, maybe they're not here tonight. Okay. All right. <laughs> so we didn't need that. Um, but I had, to, I had to allow the option because state law says they have to allow to be to beat with the board. Um, so I had to allow that um, to happen. So, okay, so we do not have the petitioners here. We just found out, uh, what was it, February 11th was the date of the vote. Uh, how does that go? Let's see. They had a petition on January 5th and let's see. It looks like um, they denied it. The Mondovi School District uh, denied it on February 8th. So both board members would approve, but I think we still probably need to vote on it. Is that accurate, Abby? I think. Yeah. It's a yeah go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Okay, uh, Commissioner Luganville. If, if the other school board denies it, if we vote yes or no, does it, you know, is it a situation where both boards have to vote in agreement or only one? I believe both have to approve it, correct? But they can appeal either way, right? So even so, we still probably want to vote on it because they can appeal it. Um, I don't know who they appeal it to exactly, but um, they can appeal it to some state authority. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Commissioner Duax. I have a question about the property. If it's con contiguous with our district, or is it separated? Their property does not touch our property. There's their property is the third down. It's it's kind of on the border, I think, from southern Eau Claire into Mondovi, but there's two pieces of property before theirs, and then it's theirs. So theirs doesn't touch ours at all, and they were asking to attach to ours, um, which it was kind of an unusual request because it's not directly touching our current boundaries. Can they, can they open and roll? Yeah. Commissioner Zhang. I was under the understanding that they are already opened and rolled into our district. Is that correct? That is not correct. They currently do not have any children. Thank or at you. least there's no children that are enrolled in school according to the petition. Hmm. Uh, Commissioner Vu. So if they are not directly attached to us, who do they pay their property tax to? It's currently Mondovi. They're in the Mondovi School District. I would point out that one of the seven factors on here is um, that we should consider is whether the proposed reorganiza reorganization will make any part of a school district's territory non-contiguous. That is one of the factors listed in the seven that's in your agenda item. But apparently other boards have done it. <laughs> True. It doesn't prevent you, okay. but it's something to consider. So what we need is a, uh, is a motion either to approve or to deny the request to, uh, let's see if we can get this right, to alter the school district boundaries for the petitioner. You sure can. Okay, so <clears throat> have we worked out the numbers to how much this is going to cost us as far as transportation or any other special needs? Currently we have not done anything. We've just responded to the request. Okay. And then I guess this will be more of a comment. Um, I think this is, this is great that there's an opportunity for something like this, but I, I will caution us as a board to, to be accepting something that another board has already rejected, meaning they, they don't want it to happen, obviously. And if we were to, to do it, we're opening pretty much, uh, we're saying okay, for other districts around here to do the same. And it's great when we're the ones receiving the students, but it won't be when the students are leaving us. So I just want to throw that out there, take it for what it's worth. Commissioner Lugabell. I move that we deny the petition to alter school district boundaries. Okay, so we second. have a motion to deny, we have a second, was that Commissioner Zhang? Yes. To, to uh, second the denial. Did you have a comment? Or? Yes, I'm going to vote for denial because I feel we're taking tax revenue from a small district, and I agree with Commissioner Zhang that this could come back and bite us sometime. And so I think we need to support the Mondovi folks. Okay, other comments? Commissioner Zhang. And this 
by no means am I trying to say that they cannot open enroll into our district. Okay. Anything else? Okay, so we have a motion on the floor to uh, deny the petitioner's request to alter our school district boundaries. Okay, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion passes unanimously to deny the alteration, the request. Okay, so next up is the strategic plan. Um, we've had um, a number of discussions about our strategic plan. Um, we've got it before us now, um, approval or amendments or send it back or whatever the board approves, uh, uh, decides to do tonight. Um, I don't know, can we pull that up? Uh, maybe we can pull it up for people. We might have to switch the screen over there. Okay, I'll give you a chance to do that. I'll get mine too. So once we get that up, okay, there we go. So the the yellow are some proposed changes based on our discussions last time and also going out to various groups after our last discussion. Um, in red is the former language that was there and you can see that in a number of locations in the document where that happened. Um, remember right, especially the mission, we, we didn't feel like the mission statement had aligned well with the vision and other statements in it. So, so let's kind of go line by, well not line by, but kind of section by section. Um, would you like to discuss that mission or proposed changes? Um, board members, uh, to those, any any um, preferences or changes you would think about for the mission? Uh, Commissioner Johnson. I I like option two better than the than the previous one. I appreciate that that suggestion. Can can you? Uh, I'm sorry. Can I can I talk? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> can you uh, explain to me which part there that just made more sense to you because I kind of like option one. I kind of like the way that option one is stated, but I don't, um, <laughs> and now this is going to sound terrible, but I'm not sure compassionate should be elevated to the mission statement. Um, I think that I like I like the way the language is phrased, but I think that it's more important for, for, for our students to have fulfilling lives. And so when we're looking at educating the whole child, I feel like that, that fulfilling term to me really fills whatever it is they need to feel whole. And so that, and that's missing in option one. Commissioner Luganville. I agree with Commissioner Johnson um, and also added that the compassion piece is, is we're keeping it in our values. So it's still there and it's still a huge part of this. Uh, good point. Commissioner Duax? I, I favor option two. Well, here's the way I'll do it then. Um, so this is, a, this is what's before us. So I would entertain a motion to remove option one and change the mission to option two statement. So moved. So I have a motion of Commissioner Johnson to use second. option two. I have a second of Commissioner uh, Duax to use option two for the mission statement. Any other comments? Okay, great. Um, then I will call the question. So all those in favor of that motion to use option two, say aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Okay. All right. Um, so let's continue on. Vision, we've had for a while, and was there any comments about vision, slogan, or district values? There were no suggested changes to that. I hope you're not suggesting to change our board goals, um, but if you <laughs> are. Uh, so any, anything from those, a vision, slogan, district values, or board goals that you'd like to make a comment on? District values? Yes. Um, do we have, are we keeping the, uh, the definitions that we have here? Is that what we're doing? Okay. We're good. Oh, okay. Yeah, good point. Yeah, okay. All right. Okay, so that's that looks good. So let's look at these uh, strategic priorities um, that are supposed to uh, more immediately um, affect our board goals. Let's just kind of do them one at a time. So academic achievement. Any suggestions or uh, 
amendments or anything you would make to that. Go ahead, Commissioner Lugenbill. I just have one quick suggestion, and it's and it's actually not to change this document, but just in the document that follows up it, just that talks about alignment to the systems assessment. It has that just as K through 12 in this section, and I would just recommend we have the same verbiage across the board with all of that. Oh, I see. Okay, I see. Um, all right, so student social and emotional growth, strategic priority number two. I still two. have questions. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Vu, go ahead. If I recall in a few of those um, sessions from the community, things that were brought up for academic achievement among students who are not traditional mainstream, particularly um, students of color and disadvantaged student. And a, um, item one, two, three does not particularly isolate that concern. So I'd like to see another bullet there that is culturally relevant in pedagogy, strate uh, strategically reaching out to that population. Uh, he's talking about strategic priority number one. Um, so you would like a fourth bullet, basically, uh, 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 addressing the, uh, mm, I don't know, culturally responsive. Uh... Sure. Okay. okay, go ahead, Commissioner. I mean, sorry. <laughs> <She's> <laughs> kind of, um, hold on. Um, Commissioner Vu, I'm wondering if we could add um, some wording to number one under academic achievement to include articulate, articulate and align a culturally relevant rigorous and engaging curriculum. That will be sufficient. Thank, Thank you. you. So I would entertain a motion to uh, amend the strategic plan to include culturally relevant. Uh, Move. Culturally. Motion from Commissioner Zhang. Second? Second. Second, Commissioner Duax. Commissioner Duax. Uh, Commissioner Johnson. As long as um, the culturally relevant doesn't lose the idea that um, that curriculum isn't is relevant um, for reasons other than culture or culture mm -hmm. is broad mm -hmm. enough to include you know male female mm -hmm. or you know age and interests of students um, so it, I, you know I don't I wouldn't want relevant to get the broader sense of relevant mm -hmm. to get lost by identifying, you know, different um, demographics, I guess. And I think that that could be addressed through the action planning. Okay, good. All right, uh, so we have a motion on the floor to amend to include culturally in front of relevant. Uh, I'll just do voice vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, one nay. So uh, five. How many we got here now? <laughs> five to one. Thank you. Okay. Anything else from from that strategic priority? Okay. Student social and emotional growth. So we have three uh, uh, bullets or items underneath that. Um, comments from board members, and I, I have one on this one. I'll let other board members go if they have anything. Commissioner Johnson. Well, I know that we think alike a lot in this area, but um, I I would feel m more comfortable if the whole child was referenced under academic achievement as well, actually, because I think when we when we say whole child, then and identify it with the social and emotional growth, we're we're sort of you know narrowly defining it as the the characteristics, perseverance, and those sorts of things, which I am a huge fan of identifying and and tracking and all of those things, but I think that. Um, our definition of whole child is broader than that to include, um, you know, not just career and college skills, but also civic engagement and, um, you know, aesthetic leisure time, you know, parenting, all sorts of things that make a, a person whole. So um, I just, at every opportunity, <laughs> want to encourage us to remember that. Okay, so the suggestion is a way of incorporating that whole child piece into the strategic priority number one. As well. Hmm. Uh, I 
suggestions. <laughs> Commissioner well, Duex. One thing the board has talked about before is is uh, being creative and having creative energy toward one's work. So I'd like that reworked as well, that that would be a part of the whole child. We were trying to define it earlier, and I think creati creativity is a very important part of being stimulated to learn. So once again, I'll make a suggested edit. <laughs> and uh, under academic achievement, uh, part two, implement a clearly defined system for goal setting and shared accountability for student achievement and for um, the development of the whole child. So move. Okay. Second. Second. So I think Commissioner Luganville was next. Uh, so Commissioner Johnson forwarded, uh, um, motioned, and uh, Commissioner Luganville seconded to add number two under academic achievement, shared accountability for student achievement and development of and development of the whole child. Of the whole child, right, right. Any discussion on that, Commissioner John? I, I know we talked about this before uh, as it pertains to that word whole child. Um, I also know that individual board members um, would get approached and it would be very hard to answer that question, what is whole child? Because to me, whole child is different from, you know, maybe to Joe. So uh, a clear defined, you know, definition for for us and the community will be will be great. Would that be part of the action steps? Would be to define what that means. I think we, you know, as educators sometimes do. We have some educational jargon in in the uh, strategic plan. So I think one of the things that we'll be talking about is perhaps adding a glossary, um, you know, to further articulate the, the way that we identify these things like whole child and culturally relevant and rigorous, um, you know, within our definitions. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor uh, to change that two out of three priority one. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. So back to no, strategic priority number two, student social and emotional growth. My one comment was it said address the needs of the whole child. And um, I'd like to do more than address the needs of them. Um, I was thinking address the needs and the growth of the child. Um, uh, so I'd like us to think bigger than just addressing their immediate needs. So I would like to make a motion to address the needs and growth of the whole child. Second. So I have a second on that. Any other discussion, any question about what I'm asking? Okay, great, thank you. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion passes. All right, let's go to collaborative cultures on the other side. Number three, strategic priority three. Any comments or anything? Now, Commissioner Johnson. Um, would it be appropriate to substitute staff for teachers so that it's more inclusive? I was thinking the same thing. And then a hyphen, not a slash. Make more sense? <laughs> so moved. <laughs> How about this? How about this? Uh, so under the proposed change, right, is what you're looking right, at, right. number three on there. Uh, promote and support strong staff. And how about just and student relationships, right. I mean, rather than a dash or a slash. So the motion would be strong staff and student place the teacher slash. Do we have a second on that? Second. So we have a motion for Commissioner Johnson, second from Commissioner Zhang to support strong staff and student relationships. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Do we have anything else uh, along uh, these lines? 
Okay, great. Uh, number four, high quality staff. Commissioner Luganville. I wasn't able to attend the last strategic plan session that you had with the group, so I'm just wondering if someone could explain why the language about compensation was taken out and where that is now housed. Sure, go ahead. Um, developing an adequate compensation plan seemed more like an action step than uh, a goal, and that if we if we really wanted to make this happen, we would take action on it rather than have it as an aspirational goal. So that would be under 4.1 and the action plan for that. Um, I just had one change, just same as last time. It said supports teacher collaboration leadership. I think staff collaboration, again, uh, for number one. So I would make a motion to amend teacher to staff. Second. So I have a second from Commissioner Dweck. Second. Uh, second from Commissioner Dweck. Thank you. Any discussion or comments on that? Okay. Uh, so we'll call a question. All those in favor of changing teacher to staff, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Anything else on number four? High quality staff. Okay, let's go to the last one, five, partnerships with families and communities. Any comments or questions or changes from um, board members on that? Okay. So I'll give you another second here, and then I'll ask for a motion to approve the entire strategic plan. Uh, Commissioner Vu. Before we approve this, i just like for more clarification. Sure. What are the next steps after this approval? <clears throat> well, as we talked um, a little bit about this with um, the teaching and learning department, because most of these aspects will fall within the teaching and learning department. I think one of the things that we will have to do is to develop a process, a feedback loop, to go with our um, district-wide communication plan. So we want to make sure we get input from all of the various work groups and all of the people who are affected by the plan. Um, we have talked about working uh, with CEC in using their template for action planning. Uh, there are other uh, templates that are available to us, but. As a superintendent, I would like to get some feedback from other administrators and uh, particularly principals and school leadership teams about how we might craft uh, really good action planning. And so we will bring that process back to you, Commissioner Vu. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. I would entertain a motion to approve the strategic plan. Move. I have a motion for Commissioner second. Zhang, second from Commissioner Vu. Any other discussion on that? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. It's been a long time coming. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. I think we, uh, on behalf of, um, you know, all of the staff, I'd really like to thank the school board for being a, a real part of this process. Um, and for serving on the committees and attending our community forums and, you know, really getting involved in the data review and all of that. I know it took a lot of time this summer. Uh, but I think we're at a critical juncture now for the school district in that this plan will give us a focus. And I think it's going to help us to address many of the issues that have been brought to us by staff. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a lot of work. Okay, um, next on our agenda is the uh, school calendar um, implementation, 2016-17. Uh, uh, what we did was um, we decided just to put on the agenda the school uh, calendar, kept it the same. There were some comments last time about, um, about perhaps modifying it, for example, to uh, change snow days the way we talked if we implement start times. Um, so we didn't do that, but that could be amended if someone wanted to do some amendments, they could. Um, but um, do you have a comment? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I do have a comment. We have the two chairs here, or the three chairs here of the, of the committees, and 
Uh, they've been talking about um, how to implement this calendar if we go to changing start times, and they have some ideas that they would like to share with you. Great. Go ahead. Good evening. Uh, we just wanted to make sure that we were clear about the different alternate calendars that might be put in place if you were going to move forward with a change in your start times. So the construction of the 1617 calendar uh, has and there have been no modifications since the last time you've seen it. And the as you look at moving into another year, perhaps uh, 1617 to implement or 1718 or 1819. The concept that we provided here with the number of instructional days and the number of professional development days, that can remain the same if we adjust the number of minutes within the day. So as you were talking about possibly adjusting the number of additional snow days or the number, amount of inclement weather time that's incorporated into this calendar, uh, President Spindler, it's, it's a reference to how many minutes we have within each calendar day. And we could reduce that uh, number of minutes, it's about two minutes per day uh, over the course of a year is the equivalent of a full day of instruction. So it's, it's two minutes and some, some odd change in seconds. Uh, but at your secondary level, uh, which is closer to the DPI uh, required number of minutes of instruction, at your, so your middle school and, and high school level, uh, we have the four additional days of inclement weather minutes built into this calendar. And then there's a fifth day, which is an optional day, uh, a potential makeup day, which we have in April, uh, which is currently scheduled as a professional development day and instructional planning day. Um, and that's put in there as an alternate for a fifth day worth of, of time that we could make up if we had to make modifications. So really just wanted to clarify that as you look at potentially uh, adjusting the number of inclement weather days, um, we are, could be talking about minutes, really, and it could be just shortening the school day in order to have that happen. Still maintaining the same number of instructional days, literally, and the same number of professional development and instructional planning time. Commissioner Duax. Have you had any complaints about the new calendar? Uh, we uh, we received feedback from the calendar. Uh, Commissioner Zhang uh, shared what uh, our Parent Advisory Council had shared. Um, there with the calendar is, is a mix of feedback, um, some for, some against. Um, I would say if, if I were to characterize what I've heard overall from staff as well as parents uh, is that this calendar works well for them, the one that we're currently living through. And I'd also just again stress that um, we're several months into it. We haven't actually lived through an entire cycle of this to truly evaluate its impact on families, uh, children, and, and our instruction. Commissioner Zhang. I'd like to add, um, <laughs> there was a lot of um, unknowns to, to a lot of uh, the parents. And as soon as they asked those questions and we were able to get the uh, answers to them, it, the calendar made sense because when we asked for a vote of who would like us to bring it up during the board session on w the different questions, there was uh, probably a quarter of the people raised their hand for it. So that's the reason why we haven't brought anything else up from the uh, calendar. Commissioner Johnson. Yeah, so um, I, don't think that, I, I don't think it would be accurate to say that the, that the parents accept and love the calendar. <laughs> I think that there was quite a, there was a lot of, you know, pretty passionate um, feedback. There was probably more conversation than I've heard of the PAC yet this year, um, you know, about any other issue. Um, you know, some of their concerns, some people felt very strongly that a full week in November was, was overkill, was unnecessary. But there was, you know, a, a couple of others that, you know, either hunted or traveled to family out of town and really liked the full week. And so there wasn't consensus for, for us to advocate forcefully for any particular change. Another one that um, received a lot, lot and I, th I don't remember now if that was the one where I was like, okay, you know, is there enough concern for us to bring this forward, raise your hands, and it, I'd say maybe a quarter to a yeah, third. Yeah, that was people. the one. Yeah. And then there was other... Um, 
there was quite a bit of conversation around the two days in June, having kids come back just for those kind of wrap up days and you know, why not end June 2nd and pick up the other two days somewhere else. But again, there was, um, you know, I guess some acceptance of the reasoning behind the way it fell, that there wasn't a strong consensus for us to advocate to any particular change um, to this. Um, I think there was also some maybe frustration that it's kind of a done deal anyway. Do you really care what we have to say? <laughs> <laughs> Anything else from board members on this? Commissioner Lugamil. I only received one um, contact from a staff member about this, and their question was about um, ACT. So I do want to publicly just clarify that um, and ask the question, because the, the question was about um, the ACT makeup days being during spring break that we have aligned with UW, and if they can use the emergency days. Yeah, we did receive approval from ACT. They've added, um, <clears throat> in the past they had the, the ACT, and then the very next day is the work keys. Um, and then they, about three weeks later, then they have the single makeup day. Um, and just recently, they have now added an emergency date in April for when um, there are unique circumstances, including avoiding spring break. Because a lot of districts had to shift their spring break last year, so they must have gotten enough feedback to allow for that. So the makeup day for us will be in April instead of in March when our spring break will be. Anything else? Okay, so what I need first is a, well, I need a motion of some kind to put this calendar on the floor or something else. So, um, or if, you, if anyone wanted to passionately change it to send it back or something. So, Commissioner Duax. Uh, I move approval of the 1617 cal calendar for the district. Okay, so we have a motion to approve this calendar. Do we have a second from anybody? Don't everyone jump on at once. Okay. I will. Okay, Commissioner Vu. So we have a second. So the calendar is on the floor. Commissioner Duax motion. Commissioner Vu seconded. So, um, so if if, uh, if you want to make changes, you can make amendments. If you if you don't feel comfortable making amendments, you can make a motion to send it back to committee, or we can approve tonight. So that's kind of your options now. It's on the floor. If you're hesitant in any way, so. So I'm going to call a question, I guess, unless someone's willing to make an amendment or something. Commissioner Lugendale? I'm not going to make an amendment, but I do want clarification on what the parent advisory group said specifically about the calendar. You said they brought up November. Was it was there a specific issue with the um, work days, with the IP days, or what um, was the? I think with the November, it was you know just the length of the break why the, that was newly necessary. And I did push them a little bit because there was a lot of conversation, but nobody was really, I guess, willing to, you know, actually take a stand on it and say, we want you to advocate for it to change. Okay. Yes, and that goes back to families wanting to travel and hunters who wants to hunt with their kids. Commissioner Duax. It does look sort of like a hunter's dream. <laughs> we had a very passionate I, hunter. I want to say that I had one complaint of a family that took extra days where it was supposed to be a parent-teacher conference, and they took a trip instead. So that's not too convenient for the teachers or the children. That was not at Thanksgiving. That was in February. Ah, uh, okay. Commissioner well, Johnson. <laughs> families are going to take vacations, you know, because if everybody goes waits till spring break, the you know the rates are crazy and the, the parks are crowded and whatever. But, but I think we've also created some of that by giving a Friday off, and that's you know one of the things I don't like about it. Um, I understand that working a twelve-hour day is is taxing. You know, lots of professions put in two 12-hour days and sometime during the year. And so, you know, I think we've created an opportunity for families to say, yeah, I'll skip teacher conferences because then I can have a five-day weekend or, you know, a four-day weekend and, and actually take a trip and only miss one or two school days. So, you know, by setting this up, well, <laughs> you all know what I think about it. Um, I, I'm not necessarily opposed to the calendar, but I'm going to vote no. And 
partly because this calendar was created by a committee of all staff and it clearly prioritizes staff needs over others. If we created a, a calendar from scratch, the parents would come up with something different. And, you know, an outside consultant who was only concerned about student learning would probably come up, up, up with something else. So, um, you know, there's definitely flaws um, that are, you know, c contradict the advantages. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, I think we'll take a roll call vote on this, if that's okay, Secretary Everson. Commissioner Vu? Yes. Commissioner Jean? Yes. Commissioner Duax? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? No. Commissioner Luganville? Yes. Commissioner Spindler? Yes. Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. All right. We adjourn to committee. Uh, equitable access for students related to gender identity. I'm, uh, I'm sorry, go, go President ahead. Spindler, but before we go on to that, there was reference in um, the calendar report about the start time plan. Um, it looks like the, their, the combined committee went on record, and it, I think we did discuss that as a board quite a bit, and it was clear that their, the board probably was feeling the same way, that it, we weren't ready to go for 1617 or we wouldn't oh. probably have approved this calendar. So mm -hmm. do you need further guidance um, for the committees to start planning for 1718? That, that's a good point. Um, yeah, I, the last time we left it is that we would discuss it more, if I remember right, um, about start times as a board. Uh, Commissioner Zhang. Well, from PAC, this is... If, don't quote me, but one of the ladies said, we either have to do something with it or we get rid of it. And I think she's right. We, if we think this is going to benefit the kids, then we gotta, we got to make a move on it. Otherwise, we need to drop it. That's a good point. And, we, and you, you're right. We did, we did leave it at the last meeting that the board would follow up to get more discussion, decide where to go. So maybe we should, for agenda setting, we should put that on to, to, to get it on our discussion again. Uh, Commissioner Luganbill. I'm just wondering where we're at with the survey to families and how that's going and when we're planning on doing that. Yep. The, um, the questions, I believe, uh, Kay has submitted to um, Michelle Radke to, or to add to the survey. The family survey is deployed on March 29th and goes through April 12th. <clears throat> Typically, we have extended that a week when, we've, when we want to try to bump numbers up. The reason why that's important is we can try to press for some preliminary data. Typically, it takes them several weeks to put together a full presentation, but if we have some targeted questions like that that we need data on sooner, we should be able to get them by early May. Then Mr. Johnson, go ahead. I would just suggest that, similar to having a referendum timeline, that perhaps um, administration can coordinate either through the committees or otherwise a timeline for, you know, this is... The, the data we need to gather, these are the people we need to talk to, here's, you know, this is how we're going to implement an action plan. Good point. I like that. Which I just thought we were waiting for data, more data uh, from the community. Same here. I was thinking that the same thing that you were saying. But another thing that, that I questioned, with what you said earlier, Commissioner um, Wendy Sue, can the survey be include question that will solicit parents' advice on calendar for 2017 and 18 feedback? I believe that's the. I believe that is what's ha what that you are submitting or that the questions are being submitted for that purpose. Correct. So not only the time start, but the calendar. It also. That I'm unsure of. Um, I know that we're just, we are facilitating the process, so um, I, Kay would have to actually speak to the exact questions. I just know that we can get them on, any questions you need for the calendar or start time or whatever can be part of the survey, it just that starts at the end of March. And if there are specific items that the board would like polled, if you will send those to me, we will give them to Michelle so that she can uh, talk with K-12 about how to best ask those questions. 
And Jim, when would she need that information? Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> we translate the survey into Hmong and Spanish, so we need a little bit of lead time. So we're going to want any data for the survey by the end of this month so that we can, because once you've done the translation, get it loaded into their platform and so forth, um, throw in spring breaks in there, um, we, it would be helpful to really have anything by the end of February. It might be helpful to get something in the Friday letter of what currently you're looking at asking so we can see if there's something that we'd like in addition to the yeah, ask. I can have Michelle can Ford. Email that to you. I can have Michelle Ford, which she's received from Kay and the committee. You know, to follow up on Commissioner Vu's comment, you know, as you know, changing start times can affect calendar. So <laughs> they definitely are related. Um, so, okay, good. Thanks for the clarification. Now we can adjourn to committee. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's, I'm glad you mentioned it. All right. So um, we have a presentation on this, right? Okay, good. All right, I'll let, I'll let you get set up. Oh, you're all there. Okay, go ahead. I'm here. I have to apologize because despite my efforts to grow a few inches for this presentation, it didn't help. So if you can't see me, it's not on purpose. I, uh, it is what it is, right? Um, so thank you again for a couple of minutes tonight to share with you um, a presentation on equitable access for students related to gender equity in the district. Um, the purpose of this discussion is to further the district's goals concerning the maintenance of positive and supportive environments for all of our students in the Eau Claire Area School District. Um, and because this conversation will center around talking about students who do not conform or are not in the stereotypical view of what it means to be excuse me, male or female, I just wanted to go ahead and identify a couple of terms for us so that we're clear as to what we're talking about this evening. Um, gender identity, as you can see, to, uh, talks about a person's deeply held sense or psychological knowledge of his or her gender. Gender nonconforming talks about uh, people whose gender expression differs from the stereotypical or prevailing social expectations. The term transgender is an adjective that describes people whose gender identity is different from their biolog biological sex assigned at birth. The term transition is used to talk about the process and period of time in which a person goes from being living and identifying as one gender to living and identifying as another gender. It is important to know that these definitions are used by several organizations, including the American Civil Liberties Union, the Gender Spectrum, the Human Rights Campaign Foundation, and the NEA, along with several other organizations, agree on the use of these terms and definitions. For the most part, how do we know that a child is going through this process? In conversation with a child, when the child is able to articulate a deep belief about how he or she feels, has followed the belief consistently over a period of time, is supported by their parents and guardians, and sometimes have sought counseling, or the second part of that is has begun medical treatments. So those are really the two ways or our working definition of how we know that a child has transitioned. And again, this identification is also used in several other school districts in Wisconsin. Um, you, what you have before you on the slide is that um, it's important to place what we are talking about within the historical context of laws and schools. Historically, we have laws and policies in place to protect all people from discrimination and harassment based on race, color, sexual orientation. For instance, Title IX prohibits sex discrimination in all educational programs or activities that are funded in part through federal dollars. Title IV of the Civil Rights Act also prohibits schools from denying students equal opportunities on the basis of race, color, religion, and sex, sexual orientation as well. In addition to federal laws, the state of Wisconsin uses state statute section 118 to also bar discrimination based on sex or sexual orientation. It's important to note that while Title IX does not expressively use the word transgender, in its policy at this time, the U.S. Department of Education and the U.S. Department of Justice have both interpreted Title IX to prohibit sex discrimination against transgender students in all realms in the educational environment. Likewise, the word transgender is also not specifically mentioned in Wisconsin State Statute 118 
and whether Wisconsin courts will read sex or sexual orientation to include transgender status is an open question at this time. It is important to note that this continues to be an evolving area of the law, both in the student and employment context, both at the state and at the federal levels. An example of how things are continuing to evolve is Assembly Bill 469. Pending in the state legislature is um, AB 469. This bill seeks to make sure that schools, or requires, I should say, schools to designate restrooms for the exclusive use by students of only one sex, which is defined as being male or female as identified at birth. It also will require schools to provide reasonable accommodations to a transgender student to use a single occupancy restroom or changing room. If this bill were to pass, state law would then be in direct contradiction with federal guidance of Title IX and other federal court rulings regarding access to bathroom facilities. As state and federal laws continue to evolve, DPI has used federal law as guidance for school districts in Wisconsin. They have stated that providing accommodations for students is a district responsibility and that school districts will vary in their approaches based on the needs of the local community. The options available to faculty and students for accommodations will vary greatly depending on the size and the facilities of the school districts. Furthermore, DPI has made it very clear that these are very complicated and sensitive issues best resolved locally. And again, DPI references a number of different organizations and literature for their um, guidance as well. In the Eau Claire Area School District, in addition to using federal and state laws, here are the relevant ECASD policies that we currently have in place. As you can see, sexual orientation is included in both policies for students as well as adults as a protected class. Due to recent court cases and the lack of clarity, along with Assembly Bill 469, it would be beneficial for our school district to be measured and thoughtful as we move into talking and discussing more about these issues in the future. As a district, we also have specific discrimination complaint procedures in place to resolve these issues should they come up. There are a couple of key areas that affect transgender students in particular, and it is important to note that schools are working with families very closely on an individual by individual case to make sure that we support and advocate for the needs of our students. To protect the privacy of our students and families, I will not be able to share specifics of how these situations have been handled, but I will be able to share general information with you based on ways that we would react or ways that we can do to support our students. Um, in looking at official student records, um, we would, in looking to change those records here at the school district, we would be using the same standards that the Department of, uh, of Transportation uses to change gender and to change name on a driver's license or work with the child in the medical community um, to know that this is happening so that we can work on changing documentation. But again, all of this is based on what we know today. Depending on where the state goes, um, it could change, which is very likely. Um, in regards to restrooms and locker room accessibility, we, we're in areas that are needed. We do have gender neutral restrooms that students can use. Locker rooms are decided on a very individualized case-by-case -case basis should that be something that students are in need of. And again, it's a very specific determination based on the needs of the student. When we look at participation in sports, um, the Eau Claire School District, like all Wisconsin school districts, are governed by WIAA rules. Therefore, we know that students who are transgender will be permitted to participate in the interscholastic athletics in a manner that's consistent with the requirements of the WIAA. Um, if these are intramural sports at our schools, certainly students will be allowed to participate with the gender that they, they identify with. Um, and certainly one of the pieces that we're looking at is the staff education piece. We have had staff members that have gone to different conferences, different workshops, um, talk to other districts about what other districts are doing and how they're interpreting DPI's recommendations and guidelines and um, making sure that, again, we're doing the very best that we can to support all of our students. 
So in following DPI's advice and in adhering to state and federal laws, what you see um, on the slide in front of you here is really the practice that has been here in the Eau Claire Area School District. We have used literature and information gleaned from different organizations, such as the U.S. Department of Education, the Office for Civil Rights, Wisconsin Association of School Boards, and the Gender Spectrum Organization, just to name a few of the places that we've gone to for literature. Through our work in the past with being culturally responsive to the needs of all of our students and families, our district staffs have respectful and cooperative relationships with all of our families. The utmost care is taken in ensuring that the child is being listened to and that families are supported in ways that they desire. As laws continue to evolve, so will our understanding of how to work with all of our families in meeting the needs of our students. Um, because of pending legislation and other complexities on this matter, as a school district, we believe that how we work with a child and their family is much more important at this time than having all the right answers. As a district, we are taking measured and systemic approaches to meeting the needs of all of our students. And I would also recommend that as we move into talking more about this at policy and governance, that we also take the very same steps um, because what we wanna do is protect and advocate for all of our students that are in our care here in the Eau Claire Area School District. So, thank you. Thank you, Kaya. Uh, any questions for Kaya while you're here? Uh, Commissioner Zhang. I, I know you, uh, you, you give a great suggestion for policy and governance, but have you gone through the uh, uh, policies that we do have? And if you did, did you see any weaknesses in there that we should proactively uh, get on top of? So what we have right now in the Eau Claire School District is um, 411, and that also covers sexual orientation. So really right now, if we interpret it the way we're supposed to, I think we're covered with that as well. Mm -hmm. Mr. Luganville. I can try to give some context on that too. Um, this was, I brought this up in May, and we started talking about it as a committee in mid-May, early June. Um, and the first group I actually called to talk about it was number four on that DPI list, which is the um, National Center for Transgender Equality. And um, in looking at our policies, they came, they pretty clearly said um, what some districts have done is they've safely kind of interpreted the current policies to, um, to say, you know, sexual orientation includes all of that. Um, but what most people are coming to the conclusion of at this stage and what the research is saying is that sexual orientation is very distinct and unique from gender identity and gender expression. They're very different things. Um, you know, one is about how a student identifies, one is, you know, about um, who they are attracted to. And so it's very, uh, they're very distinct. And that's where we came, she mentions policy 411 and that, um, a couple months ago we had a scholarship policy come across this desk and you notice there was the wording and we mentioned it at the time that simply added next to sexual orientation the two phrases gender identity and gender expression which adds transgender students as a protected class so we as a district already did that with um, that policy and I think that well I can tell you the policy and governance committee we looked at 411 and um, read through it, and we have actually made the change to add transgender students as a protected class, um, and we voted it out of committee. So it's waiting on a docket and ready to come across this desk. But what I think is, and I wanna thank Kayang and I wanna thank Jim, because what many districts are seeing is community pushback on this, and, and a lot of questions that go unanswered. And, what she, re, what she re, you know, really outlined is that we are going about this in a very measured way to make sure that we're not only protecting our system moving forward, but that we're protecting all of our students. We're doing our research. We're sending people to trainings, both in town and places within the state. So we really are taking this seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good, Good presentation. Anything else? Uh, Commissioner Lugo, you'll have to turn off here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any public comment on this issue? Okay, great. great. 
All right, so next uh, committee report is on the special education assistant, so the SEA position reclass. And um, th this is before us because um, normally, you know, this kind of thing the uh, administration could just do, but um, reclass is a change in budget, an increase in budget. And so the board actually has to approve eventually a change in budget by a two-thirds vote <laughs> to uh, spend more money. Um, so that's really why it's before you and hope it will become as a resolution to you. Um, what we're doing is, so, is, so we've understood now that the SEAs um, have a lot more duties, uh, different duties, than they're actually uh, classified as. And so this is to reclassify them for their right duties. Um, so that's what this is really about. So I don't know if we have any anyone to talk about this or I don't know if, if you have any kind of uh, anyone can expand on that uh, Abby sure I can expand on it for you um, basically the the group of SEAs has been um, on the reclass um, question for probably about five years probably since about 2008 2009 and at that point in time the union was there and so they had changed some things around with the intent to be reclassed and then when it all was said and done the reclass didn't happen and so um, just looking back or to back to 2009, we kind of looked at it and said, okay, their duties are very different and they do have a lot more responsibilities. And so um, we decided that it would be important to ask the board to grant the reclass outside of the normal CPI um, increase because normally that's where the reclass dollars would come from. And so because this is very important to, um, and then you can see in the report, it'll affect over 100 employees um, to reclass them. And so we felt it was very important to bring it before the board and ask for the reclass to happen outside of the CPI increase for 1516. Thank you. And you notice from the uh, agenda item, it looks like the increase in costs is about 33000 correct? Okay. That is correct. Commissioner Luganville? For the record, they deserve every cent. Any other discussion or questions about this? Commissioner Duax? I just had a question about what going from 30 to 40 in the classification, what that means. So basically right now they um, are on a salary schedule, which is level 30, um, which is just shared with Head Start assistance and special education assistance. And that pay range for them is currently $12.89 to the top of $14.96. So by moving them to level 40, they would um, the new range would be 1317 an hour to 1523 an hour. And that's based upon 1415 because our 1516 numbers haven't been updated yet. Um, and then again, this would also be reevaluated as we're working through the compensation study as well. Any other questions? Okay, so I uh, plan to put this on as a resolution next time. Reasonable. All right. All right. Uh, Commissioner Johnson. Um, so we're kind of halfway through our budget year. Um, I know it's hard to, to really predict, but does it look like we're going to come in under the projected budget as we had the last few years? That's a great question, Commissioner Johnson. I have not um, reviewed that yet. Um, we are going to have a fund balance report this week at budget development, so I'm hoping to have um, a good answer for that, um, for budget development, and then they can report back to you at the next board meeting. Good. Anything else? We have that question a lot in budget now with things coming forward. <laughs> okay. All right. So next, discussion of possible first reading of, oh, I'm sorry, any public comment on that SEA, excuse me. Oh, okay, all right. Uh, discussion and possible first reading of new policy 133 board vacancies. So let's pull that up here. So uh, we had used a certain process um, last time when we had a resignation last summer. Uh, we developed to meet that need at the time, um, and so we, decided then that we should probably have something in policy so that whenever it happens in the future we have a set policy. We don't have to redesign from start every time. Um, so the PNG worked on um, a board vacancy policy of how to fill future vacancies that occur. So I'll open it up um, for uh, board members to make comments or questions and uh, maybe we can do a first reading tonight. Commissioner Lugamel? 
I do want to add that anything that you might see is missing from this that was incorporated in our actual procedure of filling the vacancy, we would follow up and have as part of the rules for this policy. Uh, so what do you, example, what would be missing or? Um, the, the, full, the full procedure sheet that, that was used. Um, oh, like the, 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 the candidates would fill out and so forth. Okay, I see. Commissioner Vu. I wonder the third paragraph in, the, in this um, paper, we talked about temporary vacation for military leave. What about medical leave? Someone undergone a surgery and will be out of commission for a certain time. Commissioner Johnson. Um, well, we, we can miss as many board meetings as we want to, really. I mean, if, if I decide not to. <laughs> well, but it's, so I think that the key difference is that there is a way to have someone fill that seat, you know, that, you know, but each individual board member, you know, and I, I actually kind of thought of, well, health, change of domicile, or other, other compelling reason. Well, you don't really need a compelling reason. Any board member can, you know, just quit because they'd rather be home, you know, watching trashy TV on Monday nights. Um, but, so the, the key difference is a military leave would be the only exception where there's a, a, temp, a vacancy where the board member would come back and say, okay, you're out. If you don't want to give up your seat for any other reason, then you just stop coming to meetings and don't resign. There, there's a, a definite procedure that we need to follow. That's why it's there. But like Commissioner Johnson said, if for reasons of health you feel you have to resign, you can do that. I guess you can string it out for quite a while. Um, but, but for the military, there is a procedure that we needed to include. Was that in state law or something <coughs> that that was in? Or it's federal. Federal. Okay. Um, was there a follow-up on that? Please. Uh, Commissioner Vu? <coughs> it's not about what purpose that that person will be um, attending to that require him or her to be away. I think the matter mm -hmm. is how many days that board member will be out of commission because without him or her's input, the longer that absent, the hurtful it is for the district. So we should come up with, for example, three months or four months out of commission, then you need to be able to have a replacement. Just give an example. <coughs> Commissioner Luganville. So I want to clarify a couple things. I think that um, you bring up some interesting points and we're actually, as one of the rabbit holes that we found with this policy, is that there's a need to have a policy on um, removing a board member from office. Um, because we are allowed that under certain, um, you know, uh, designations by state law. And I would assume one of them is if you simply don't show up for four months and run the clock, um, I'm assuming a board member could remove you from, from office. But um, well, I don't think so. we could. I'm, I'm not sure about that, actually. Okay. Uh, well, we're, what, the reason I'd bring that up is um, because his, what he's asking about someone who's, you know, would, would need to be removed from office, um, we're looking at having that as an additional policy. Um, we, we had the recommendation from our board attorney that um, because we actually had a small piece in here about that and it was taken out because we had the recommendation of if you're going to talk about removing people we really need to have a separate policy to outline what we legally can do Yeah, because I believe it's it's rather if it's possible at all restrictive to do that um, generally it's by a vote of the electorate to remove someone um, so well there's language about going to court Mm -hmm. and that only a judge can remove a board member. <coughs> Commissioner Zhang. I was under the same impression, but uh, if that was the case, I would like it to obviously go through legal, which you guys are already doing. If that's, if that's the will of the board to add 
another section about that, about removal of a board member, then we can go back to that. Would that not be a different policy? That, that would be a different policy number. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So there's nothing about that in this one, though. And it's just how to fill the vacancy. Okay. Okay. It appears to me that the guidelines are similar to what we use for filling the, the last part uh, the last time around. Okay. All right. I'll make sure. I want to see if anyone has any other comments first before that. Commissioner Johnson. Well, uh, there's a lot of wills instead of shells. I just think we should be consistent. Um, shell is a direction from this board to future boards to say this is the policy and tell you do otherwise. So I would just say change the wills to shells. And then um, just for kind of chronology, ease of understanding the process, the the fourth paragraph, a qualified elector is selected, she'll take the oath. To me, that belongs at the very end of the policy, um, kind of after the process. Then you take the oath before you, good point. Before you take over. Very good point, yep. Mm -hmm. So you would move the uh, fourth paragraph to the end. Make sure I understand that military leave piece. <laughs> yeah. um, I didn't have a chance to read that ahead of time. Okay. Is that is that language on the military? Is that basically from? <clears throat> The guidelines from Fed Federal or something. That's from Altoona, but Altoona's policy did cross-reference uh, laws pertaining to this. Okay. But this wording is um, the, the that's the wording that the Altoona School District used. It is okay. Are people comfortable with the first reading, with the changes of moving wills to shalls and the fourth paragraph to the last? First shall be last, or the fourth shall be last. Quick question, uh, Mr. John. Being that you got this from Altoona, what, what was their, what was the date on that? I trust you. If it's recent, then I'm good. If it's not, let's do something about it. Well, it was 2012, so. All right, we ready for first reading? Okay, um, let's kind of do it, I don't know, a couple paragraphs at a time, or do like four paragraphs at once or something like that. <laughs> what, are, what are you comfortable with? What's that? Go ahead, sure. And did you want to change the wills to shells? Yes, do you want? During board? part of the first reading? I think that makes sense. The wills to shells, can everyone do that? That makes sense. I will try. Okay. I don't I'll see anything I'll here. I'll correct so. you if I see it. Okay, board vacancies, 133 cause of vacancies board member uh, resignation if for reasons of health change in domicile or other compelling reasons a board member decides to terminate service the board requests earliest possible notification of intent to resign so that the board may plan appropriate appropriately for this uh, exigency urgent need uh, resignations shall that's good right yeah. shall <laughs> shall shall be made in writing and delivered to the board clerk the resignation shall take effect at the time indicated in the uh, written resignation or if no time is therein indicated and then upon delivery of the resignation okay I'm gonna leave the second paragraph for the last person to read Filling vacancies. Vacancies on the school board shall be filled in accordance with state law and in substantial compliance with the procedural outline, uh, guidelines outlined in this policy. 
Okay. Do you want, do you want to do the, you can do the next short paragraph. Thank you. Temporary vacancies for military leave. If a board member in, enters the armed forces of the United States and removes himself or herself temporarily from the school district, such temporary removal shall constitute a temporary vacancy of office. Okay. Temporary vacancies shall be filled as other vacancies are filled, except that no election need to be held need be held to fill any part of the temporary vacancy. The term of the person appointed shall not extend beyond the expiration of the term of the board member who entered federal service. In the event the original board member completes the federal service and returns to the district during his or her original term of office, the board member may file with the clerk of the district or municipality within 40 days of completing the federal service a statement under oath that the federal service has terminated and the board member elects to resume office. Upon the filing of the statement, the term of the temporary board member shall cease and the returning board member shall be entitled to resume the duties of the office. I'll let you go. I see lots of shells. <laughs> Did you guys do that on purpose? <laughs> Appointment guidelines. Applicants must complete and submit the commissioner application to the Eau Claire Area School District as given in the application instructions. The application shall be advertised in a variety of communication mediums. All completed applications shall be provided to board members. Applicants shall be required to give a mi maximum three minute statement. The board may ask questions of the candidates but may not ask questions about how they may vote on future matters before the board. After all candidate statements have been made, the board shall select a candidate as follows. One, board members shall be given a prepared ballot with applicants' names. Board members shall vote and sign their names to the ballots. Ballots shall be collected and the votes with board member names read aloud and tallied by the clerk or clerk designee. Mr. Sure vote. The successful applicant must receive a majority vote of all members for votes. A, if there are more than two applicants, a first ballot will be taken. Shall. Shall, thank you. <laughs> if no one receives a majority for votes, then the candidate receiving the lowest number of votes will be dropped. Shall. <laughs> thank you. If there is more than one candidate, with the lowest number of votes, then all will be dropped Shall unless, again. thank Shall. you, unless there would be only one remaining candidate. In that situation, then the vote will be taken repeatedly until there are at least two remaining candidates after dropping those with the lowest number of votes. B, once a candidate or candidates have been dropped, then a vote will be taken on the remaining candidates. And again, that shall. Thank you. C, this e elimination process will be continued. Shall. Thank you. <laughs> until one candidate receives at least four votes. D, I won't leave anything, Kejo. If a tie. Maybe number three, that's good. <laughs> no, and the other. <laughs> If a tie occurs between two remaining candidates, then voting shall occur two more times for a total of three. If there is a tie on the third vote, then heads and tails will be assigned to the two candidates and a coin will sh mm -hmm. shall. shall be flipped by the clerk or clerk designee to determine the appointment. The person so appointed shall serve in that capacity until a successor is elected in the next school board election. And what was the section at the top? Uh, paragraph, paragraph four. A qualified. a qualified elector who is selected to fill a board vacancy shall not take office unless and until he or she has taken and filed the oath of office. The oath shall be filed on or before any date or deadline that the board establishes for the appointee to take office. Perfect. Okay. So we'll bring that to the board next time. I should have asked if there's any public comment already on this, but mm -hmm. I assume not. Then okay. <laughs> they say you got to hear it first. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you guys might want to turn off your uh, turn off your mics here. So thank you. Okay. Last thing uh, for us is we get an update on membership count. Uh, Tim Liven, come on up.
will be very quick. Use the same format uh, that we did at the beginning of the year uh, when we shared our enrollments with you uh, overall as a district and then we broke it down by schools. Uh, that's the inf information that the Demographic and Trends Committee is, is using to assess uh, capacity issues and crowding issues or space issues at the elementary school. Uh, but what we did here is we simply use the, um, we take two counts uh, that are uh, reported to the state to determine our membership. Uh, one is the third Friday in September and the second count is the second Friday in January. Uh, that's what these numbers are based on. As you can see overall, uh, our district enrollment is at 11,070. Those are for actual students who are in pre-K-12. Uh, we do remove 66 students who are on our membership count who are uh, second or third year seniors. Uh, and since they would have been counted the previous years, uh, we don't double count them uh, at this point for the report, although they are, uh, they are included on our membership count. Um, so you can see, uh, based on the APL study that was done in 2015, our district enrollments are um, uh, at or above the range uh, overall as a district. Our pre-K numbers are significantly higher uh, than what the APL had projected. Uh, <clears throat> we don't know exactly why that is. The APL study identifies uh, that our early learning enrollments would be at about 87.5% of, of four-year-old uh, four-year-olds who are eligible. Uh, it's possible that either our birth rates are higher or uh, more likely that we have more than 87 percent of our families enrolling their children in uh, early learning. Uh, and then I brought it, broke it down by K-5 and 6-8, uh, both of which you can see are uh, near the, the uh, top projection from the Applied Population Laboratory or in the middle school uh, situation above that uh, range. Uh, and the high schools are uh, slightly below. At the beginning of the year, the high schools were within the range. Keep in mind, second semester, uh, we have some students who graduate early. Uh, we also have with some students at 18 years old, they may drop out of high school, not be attending, uh, and then come back and enroll as a second year senior um, at the start of next school year. Um, and then uh, overall, if we took out the uh, early learning, uh, to identify where we are as a district because again early learning is not a mandatory uh, enrollee from the state again our, our enrollment does fall within the range uh, projected by the applied population laboratory so we are um, again consistent with our enrollments from the beginning of the year to the middle of the year thank you any uh, questions from board members I think it's a uh, Says something good about APL that they're projecting pretty well. So, okay, great, thank you, appreciate that. Um, request for future agenda items, uh, Commissioner Lugenbill. I have two. Um, so I would like to see the draft change that the Policy and Governance Committee proposed to Policy 411, equal education opportunities. Um, and then I would also like, and maybe it could just be oh, a lot. That was which one? Policy. Policy 411 Policy. on equal education opportunities. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, and then maybe it could just be a written report, but I want some more information about dyslexia in our school district. If we have information, um, I want to specifically know um, what kind of assessment tools and accommodations we have in our district, and if. Um, staff are being trained currently and what um, you know our plans moving forward with that okay great got it anything else I just like to mention to board members um, I'm gone all day Wednesday so for agenda setting it'll be two of you this time okay just so you know all right I would take a motion to adjourn second. Motion from Commissioner Duax a second from Commissioner Zhang all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed motion passes we're adjourned Good, Gordon. This program is recorded and presented by Chippewa Valley Community Television. Chippewa Valley Community Television is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, you can contact us by calling 715-839-5067 or on the web at www.cbctv.org.